So um, I have an hour with you, and this is, a, this is a big topic. It's a lot of ground to cover. So we're going to do a survey of drugs, devices, and surgery. And I'm going to try to do that to allow, again, about 10 minutes at the end for us to have a conversation about some of these things. So this is me and my disclosure of my financial relationship with industry. Huh. These are the objectives. So we want to go through these three topics and have you walk out of here with some idea of their rationale and the indications for them the efficacy in terms of weight loss and health benefits, and then their tolerability and safety profiles. So the first concept I want to get across is that there is nothing magic about drugs. There's nothing magic about uh, devices. There's nothing about surgery. These are all about helping patients adhere through to better behaviors around diet and physical activity. So surgery and medications and those Diets do not exist unless they are, you have as a foundation physical activity, diet, and the behaviors around physical activity and diet. So now let's talk about what we can expect if we make a recommendation to our patients to lose weight, to be more physically active, to reduce food intake. How many patients can succeed with our advice to help them lose weight? Well, it's not very good. It's about one in five patients does very well with self-directed weight loss. That's good for those patients, but for the four or five patients who don't do as well, we need to up our game. And for those patients, uh, this came out of the, the uh, guidelines that we worked on for five years, and, it, and, and what it says is that if for patients to really be successful with weight loss, it takes some skills training. And that skills training in behaviors around diet and physical activity is best delivered in, at a minimum of 14 sessions over six months and then follow up for one year. And if we do that, we can reliably produce, on average, about 8 kilograms or 8% weight loss. Not every patient in these structured programs responds, but about 70% do. So if patients fail at self-directed weight loss, the way to up the game is to put them in one of these structured programs. So this can be in an individual counseling paradigm. It can be in group counseling. I think patients do a little better in groups because it helps reinforce that normative behavior. It can be given telephone or face-to-face -face counseling. It does, it can be, you can set up a program, a um, uh, MDPP program in your office. You can get certified in that and deliver this yourself and get paid to do it. Or you can, you can refer out, you can refer to a, a program in your community or sometimes community hospitals will offer these weight management programmatic approaches, or there's some commercial ap approaches that are pretty good that have an evidence base to support them. Jenny Craig, Nutrisystem, Weight Watchers. But it's this, it's this, this training around these behaviors that I think patients need. So m al almost most patients will do very well in these programs, but again, not all. About 30% of the patients in these programs actually need additional help. And that's where we pull in our drugs, devices, and bariatric surgery. Okay, and I showed you this slide yesterday, and that is the amount of weight loss that we need varies according to what our targeted health endpoint is. We can get a lot of good benefit at these lower levels of weight loss for patients who don't have very severe complications. So 3%, we can start to see improvements in glycemia. 5%, 10%, we can, we can start to see improvements in how patients are feeling and functioning, improvements in symptoms of urinary stress incontinence, improvements in sexual function, improvements in quality of life, bit more weight loss, we can start to see improvements in symptoms of sleep apnea, in uh, the inflammation that's associated with 
uh, with uh, NASH, and we can, and with a 15% or more weight loss, we probably can make an impact on, um, on cardiovascular events and mortality. So modest weight loss has benefits, more weight loss has additional benefits. Um, where your patients are currently going for their weight loss advice is, let's face it, it's the internet. They are spending five hours a day on the screen. That's where they are. They're on the internet, and that's where they're getting a lot of their information about weight management. So before patients come to you, believe me, they have searched for weight loss advice on the internet, or they've been in a hotel room and been subjective to the infomercials about the Brazilian beach body, or they have watched Dr. Oz and all of his wonderful advice about you know, magical things to produce weight loss, or they've been subjected to popular books about diet, or they've gone to the drugstore and seen a whole row of supplements out there. Most of these things do not work. There is not one supplement that has an evidence base to support its efficacy for weight loss. The, your patients are going to all of these unproven and potentially uh, harmful approaches for their weight loss advice. Moving on, patients can go to some pretty good programs that are available in the community. So pharmacy clinics are now starting to provide weight loss advice. Uh, some, some churches have health ministries and offer weight counseling sessions, and those can be quite good. We've got the YMCAs delivering the diabetes prevention programs, work sites, wellness programs are becoming ubiquitous. We've got the commercial programs out there. By the time they've been to you, they get to you, they have been through all of these programs and more than one time. So the patients who come to see me have had multiple weight loss attempts, 10, 15, 20 weight loss attempts. They've tried everything in the book. So why would we, and I think everybody in this room needs to, be, uh, needs to be knowledgeable about the tools that only we can prescribe, and that's medications. We all need to be knowledgeable about these medications. It's only been since 2012 that we have some good FDA-approved medications for chronic weight management. We need to know about these medications because our patients need help in this area. So the rationale for medications is that food intake is biologically determined. And these medications work through biology in the brain mostly to affect food, to affect hunger and satiety and resistance to that reward eating so that patients better adhere to a dietary approach. It's, uh, the medications don't work on their own. They help the patients better adhere to their intention to follow a, a, a reduced calorie diet. So patients who are taking medications will lose more weight than if they are on lifestyle alone. And the, 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 that more weight is associated with greater health benefit. So the reason we use medications is to help patients who are struggling to achieve meaningful levels of weight loss. And the other reason we're using medications, and to me, this is the big benefit of these medications, is to help maintain that very hard one weight loss. So help patients lose more weight, get more health benefit, and sustain that weight loss. So we have some guidelines out there that help support using medications for weight loss. In 2013, when we did those obesity guidelines, there were no medications on the market. The only medication that was out there was Arlistat or Zenical. But since then, we have four new medications, and I'm going to be talking to you about those. And we have some guidelines. So the Endocrine Society did a systematic evidence review and put out guidelines around medications that drive weight gain and the medications that are approved for weight loss. And then the ACE uh, organization has put out recent obesity guidelines where they really support the use of pharmacotherapy for patients who have more severe complications of obesity and who need to get that health benefit from weight loss. So 
go to, if you are interested in prescribing for weight management and learning more about drugs that drive weight gain, this is a great resource for you. You just Google Endocrine Society Pharmacotherapy Guidelines and you can download it. Here it is the published in the Journal of Clin Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. But what, it's do, what these guidelines do is they look not just at the drugs approved for weight loss, but they also look at all those prescriptions that we're writing that promote weight gain. So, Understanding how to use these medications is important. It's important in the context of helping pa patients lose more weight and getting more health benefits. But you know, these, it's only been recently that we've had some good medications and medications for weight loss and weight management have gotten a bad rap and they have deserved to have it because our earlier medications weren't really studied properly. They were studied in short-term studies. They were studied for, uh, in small numbers of patients. And I think we thought, oh, we'll reduce the patients and then we'll stop the drug because they don't need to continue this medication. So we don't really need this long-term approach. But now we know this is a chronic disease. These medications need to be prescribed just like blood pressure medication, just like statins, other lipid lowering medications. It's not, they're not there just to produce weight loss, they're to help sustain that hard won weight loss. So the FDA evaluates medications very scrupulously. They require large studies, more than 2,000 people treated on the medication, an equal number on placebo. They want to see one-year data, and then they want extensions out to two years. They want to evaluate both efficacy and safety. So the efficacy numbers that will be required will be much smaller, but they want these large numbers to really get a better look at safety of these compounds. So they want to look at the average weight loss, and then they want to look at weight loss that's proportional, the, the proportion of patients who can achieve certain ben benchmarks, 5% weight loss and 10% weight loss. And they require an average difference between a lifestyle intervention and the drug, lifestyle intervention with placebo and the drug, they want to see an average difference that approximates 5% or more. And they also want to see that a significant proportion of patients can achieve at least 5%. And um, that's, that's usually, they want to see at least 35%, and they want to see double the amount on placebo. So then if the drug passes that efficacy and safety standpoint, they want to look at a big cardiovascular outcome trial. So every one of these drugs is required to have a CVOT associated with it. So these are the best practices. Follow the label. This is not a situation where you want to be a cowboy and go off label. There are too many examples of disasters that I can cite to you when people went off label on these on earlier drugs. So look, let's keep in the corral, let's follow the label. And know, uh, know these drugs, get briefed on them by your rep. Uh, go to the dinner meeting and learn all about each individual drug. Um, so first of all, do no harm. Learn all the warnings and contraindications. Consider the secondary benefits of these medications because as you can see, they can produce benefits beyond just weight loss. And then talk to your patient. The decision to, about which drug to use is a shared decision with your patient. You're gonna evaluate efficacy at three months and I'm gonna teach you why. And then you're going to use these drugs over the long term, like you do other medications for chronic diseases. Remember, there is no ideal medication. I don't have a favorite. In, in the right patient, any one of the drugs I'm talking about can be a good drug. But in the wrong patient, any one of the drugs I'm talking about can be a bad drug. You need to know they don't work in every patient. We don't phenotype our patients very well at the start. So within in treatment for any drug, there's a subgroup, about 20, 25%, who just don't respond. So we need to, if they're not losing weight, we're not gonna continue the med medication. And I'm gonna teach you the stopping rules for these medications. And remember, they don't work on their own. 
These are helping patients better adhere to the intention to diet. It's, they, you can't give the drug and expect patients to skip meals. They have to be trying to eat a healthier diet because that's how the medications are gonna help them. Here's a drug we all know, fentermine. Does, has, any, has everybody here written fentermine? Yeah, it's a very, very commonly prescribed medication. And it's been around since 1959. And it is, it, so it was one of those earlier drugs that we don't have a lot of evidence about. It's a sympathomimetic agent. It, it, it increases heart rate and blood pressure. So it's, it's, it's noradrenergic. It's driving norepinephrine and epinephrine levels in the body. And so it can have some side effects, and some patients don't like these stimulant side effects. And so it has dropout rates of about 17%. So, but most patients tolerate this drug. And in fact, some patients like that feeling of stimulation that this, that fentermine can give. The most important thing about fentermine is stay in the dosage range. Do not increase above equivalent of 30 milligrams of fentermine a day. You know, so it comes in eight milligrams, 15 milligrams, and 30 milligrams. When it's combined with a base, it, it, it will look like 37 and a half milligrams of fentermine, but that's really just 30. So stay within the dosage level because you do not want to promote increased heart rate and increased pulse. And in fact, those endo guidelines give a strong warning about this and that in patients with uncontrolled hypertension or a history of heart disease, don't use the sympathomimetic agents fentermine and diethylpropion. So diethylpropion is just two fentermine molecules hooked together. Okay, so let's look and see um, something about the doses of fentermine. So we don't have a lot of data on fentermine. This actually comes from a study that was done in phase two around Qsimia, that's fentermine and topiramate combination. So I've pulled out the placebo arm in light blue and then the two doses of fentermine that were studied, seven and a half milligrams and 15 milligrams. So yeah, they produce uh, five and a half, six percent weight loss compared to 1.7 percent in placebo. This is at 24 weeks, at six months. So the message here is that you don't get a whole lot more weight loss by increasing that dose of fentermine. So don't do it. I sometimes see patients coming in to see me who are on 60 milligrams of fentermine, and that's, you shouldn't be doing that. Now the problem with fentermine from your perspective is that the label says this drug should only be given for a few weeks. And that's generally interpreted to be three months. So your state board of medical examiner can decide that you're not a good doctor if you are prescribing off-label, if you're prescribing fentermine for patients over, you know, for longer than three months. So I want to tell you, you can prescribe this drug according to the label, and you do that by giving it intermittently. And there's actually some evidence to support that fentermine can be given intermittently. There you go. And this is a study from Europe don't look at the x at the y axis because this is just the completers it's a selected sample and you are not going to get this much weight loss so don't even think about that i know this doctor dr monroe and this you cannot repeat that you cannot replicate this study so don't get any ideas about this this drug produces on average about 5% greater weight loss than you would achieve with placebo alone. There's a lot of variation around that number. But look, in the blue, um, in, the, in the bottom two lines, the, the, we see placebo and a really good lifestyle intervention, I might add, that's producing some weight loss. And then in green, we've got continuous fentermine, and the triangles are for intermittent, alternate fentermine and placebo. Six weeks on, six weeks off. They're virtually identical to continuous. So if you're gonna prescribe fentermine, stick with the label, keep people on it for three months, let them have a little breather, put them back on it if, if that's appropriate. And do not prescribe it in patients who don't have uh, controlled 
hypertension or who have cardiovascular disease. Don't prescribe it in those instances. So here are the other drugs that are available. These are the newer medications that have been evaluated. So Orlistat has been around since 97. It doesn't really affect appetite, and that can be a problem. But let me tell you, Orlistat is safe, safe, safe. So it's a good choice from that point of view. And the way it works is it reinforces the low-fat diet. Because if you eat fat on Orlistat, it's a pancreatic lipase inhibitor. It's going to block the absorption of 30% fat. If you have a high-fat uh, meal or dessert, like my chocolate souffle last night, you are going to know it because you're going to have malabsorption of that fat and you're going to have steatorrhea. Okay, so it's, there's, it's, it can be a good drug. But these four newer medications are... Um, Lorcaserin, which um, fentramine topiramate combination, naltrexone bupropion combination, and loraglutide. Now, lorcaserin was scheduled, but it really doesn't have abuse potential. The FDA was thinking, oh my goodness, everybody is going to be, you know, breaking down the doors to get this lorcaserin. Let's put, let's schedule it to to limit its use. But it's real, it's, it, even though it's scheduled, it has really no addiction potential. And in fact, of the medications that are here, it probably has the, the best tolerability profile. But it, it targets the 5-HT2C receptor. So the serotonin 2C receptor. There are seven subclasses of serotonin receptor. The one on the heart is the 2B receptor. And so, medications, serotonergic medications that are dirty, that hit multiple targets, can cause valvulopathy. So this drug was specifically created to avoid that. The 2C receptor is the one in the brain that regulates appetite. So fentramine and topiramate were really developed around the observation of fentramine being associated with weight loss and topiramate which is used for migraine headaches and for epilepsy, also being associated with weight loss. So these are low doses. The recommended dose is only seven and a half milligrams of fentramine, and it's uh, 40 milligrams, 46 milligrams of topiramate. So lower doses combined together. Now, Trexone and bupropion, bupropion is an antidepressant or used for smoking cessation. You've all written this drug, you're familiar with it. And then the naltrexone, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, the naltrexone is an opioid antagonist. And so when combined together, it promotes additional weight loss. Um, Loraglutide, you all know from using uh, Victoza. This is Loraglutide at three milligrams, not 1.8 milligrams. And this GLP-1 receptor agonist. This drug, do, GLP-1, does a lot more than just affect glycemia. It affects food intake, too. And it really has pleiotrophic effects throughout the body. So these are the medications and how they work. And in terms of efficacy, they've all met the same FDA benchmarks. So let's talk about how we go about judging efficacy of these different compounds. And the concept I want you to get, across, to get across to you is that there's a lot of variation in weight loss response. This is true for medications, for devices, for bariatric surgery, for our lifestyle intervention. And to illustrate that, these are waterfall plots. So each patient's weight change is shown here as a bar. So in gray, we have lifestyle modification alone. And you can see some patients lost a lot of weight. Some patients actually gained weight. Compared to, in the same study, the recommended dose of fentramine topiramate in green, almost all patients lost weight in this study. And the, the majority lost more than 5% weight loss. So much better than that lifestyle alone when you're looking in aggregate. But still, there were some patients who didn't lose weight and, in fact, gained weight. And that's true even with the higher dose of topiramate in purple. This is also true for lorcaserin. I'm showing you here more waterfall plots. Same thing is true with lorcaserin. Big variation in response. 
Same thing is true with loraglutide three milligrams. This isn't a waterfall plot. The first panel, A, is the average weight loss. Panel B shows the proportion who achieved either 5%, 10%, or 15% weight loss, according to whether on loraglutide or placebo. But over on the right, panel C, you see loraglutide and placebo weight losses, so that more patients on, on loraglutide achieve those different levels of weight loss, but some patients on the placebo were able to lose weight, but you were far more likely if you were on loraglutide. So same, again, big variation in response. And the same thing is true for naltrexone and bupropion. This is true for all of these drugs. So when you say to me, Donna, what is the best drug? Which drug produces the most weight loss? I cannot answer that for your individual patient. I can tell you that for an average patient, but gosh, we don't have any average patients. I wish we did. Now, this shows you, this is a great uh, paper, and it was about looking, trying to look at the, um, the, the relative value of, in terms of efficacy and tolerability among these medications. So what you see on the x-axis is the probability of being highest ranked in the odds of achieving 5% or more weight loss. And what you see on the y-axis is the probability of having the fewest adverse events. So the placebo group has the fewest adverse events, but also the least likely to produce 5% or more weight loss. On the other end of the spectrum, we have loraglutide and fentramine uh, topiramate producing more weight loss on average, but also having more adverse events, and the other drugs sort of fall into the middle. So that gives you some relative idea. So we have stopping rules for all these medications because we have such variation in response. So we don't want to give medications to people who are not receiving benefit of them. So each one of these drugs has in their label a stopping rule. That, and you evaluate the patients for weight loss. If the patient's losing weight, you're going to continue. If not, you're going to stop. So there's some variations in, among these, but in general, a good rule of thumb is 12 weeks, you want to see 4 or 5% weight loss. And if you got that, that patient is going to keep losing weight and it's going to end up achieving more than 10% weight loss. So those are your responders. That's how you identify them. You identify them in the first three months and then you keep treating them because they're going to do very well. Now, all of these drugs are different. They have uh, slightly different um, off-target effects. And so you need to know them. And I cannot teach you this and everything about bariatric surgery and the devices in one hour. So I'm going to hit the high points. And if you're going to be a prescriber of any of these, you're going to get, you're going to get uh, updated by your rep on the drug that you're prescribing. So. Um, the big issue with fentramine is, of course, the noradrenergic actions. Be careful about that. With Arlistat, it's problems with, with fat absorption and steatorrhea. With fentramine topiramate, most important, this should not be prescribed in, in women of childbearing age unless you're very cautious about pregnancy because topiramate is associated with oral clefts. So you want a pregnancy test before you start the drug, you want the patient on good contraception, and you can do a monthly pregnancy test at home just to be sure. For lacaserin, you want to be careful about prescribing this with other SSRIs and other serotonin, serotonergic agent. But in general, it's a very well-tolerated drug. For naltrexone and bupropion, you cannot give this to people who are taking chronic opioids. And there are some issues with the bupropion uh, unmasking seizures. So for patients with seizure disorders, this is not a good drug. For loraglutide, we all know this. We're not going to give it in patients uh, who have a family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma or MEN2. And we're aware of the complications of all drugs in this class uh, with uh, acute pancreatitis. So when you see your patient, if your patient has a history of seizures, you're thinking, 
no naltrexone and bupropion, no chondrate. If your patient has kidney stones, you're thinking no Qsemia, no Orlistat, because those are associated with kidney stones. If you're thinking glaucoma, if your patient has glaucoma, you're not gonna prescribe uh, fentramine topiramate. And if your patient has uncontrolled hypertension, you're not pr prescribing naltrexone, bupropion, or fentramine. And for patients with coronary artery disease, no fentramine. For patients with moderate to rear severe renal impairment or moderate to severe hepatic impairment, you can give these medications, but you gotta go to the label and read about the dose adjustments. So how do we choose? How do we actually go about choosing a particular drug for a particular patient? So you're thinking about aspects of the drug, you're thinking about aspects of the patient, and then you need to be thinking about what you know and your degree of comfort with these medications. So you're not prescribing these drugs unless you know them. So this is how it works. Um, first, a little bit about the dual benefits. So you know, uh, bupropion has an indication for smoking cessation. So if I have patients who are trying to quit smoking and lose weight, this is my choice. For depression, bupropion is, has an indication for depression, and so I like contrave, naltrexone, and bupropion in patients with depression. For migraines, hey, fentramine topiramate. Topiramate has a migraine indication. For diabetes, we're getting dual benefits on glycemia with loragotide 3 milligrams. Listen, chronic constipation, Arlistat is great. It's true, and don't be laughing, because let me tell you, Orlistat can be a really good drug in the right patient. Elevated LDL, Orlistat, because you know if you're on a low-fat diet, which you are on Orlistat, you're gonna have an effect on LDL reduction. So the, what we actually do in the clinic is we, if a, I have a patient with a contraindication, that drug is off the table. Then the truth of the matter is, it's what can the patient afford? That is the fact. So here I'm showing you um, the, uh, the uh, we did a formulary search in different states uh, for all the different medications to see what might be covered and what might not. It's highly variable. It's very much regional. It's who the employers are in your particular patient population. Um, yeah, you have to do a prior authorization. Yes, it's a pain in the neck, but if you want to help your patients, unfortunately, that is what you have to do. The next thing I do is I go into the shared decision-making mode. I give patients a list of the potential medications and I say, go off, get on the internet, read about these, come back, we're gonna pick one of them. And so, then we, we together make the shared decision about which drug to use, and then we, we try it. If the drug is working, great. I'll know that by 12 weeks. If not, I stop and I try something else. And yes, when patients don't respond to one, I can get a great response to another. So I recently had a patient who stopped on Lorcasrin, not having an effect, started that patient on naltrexone bupropion, Great response. Hey, that's good. That's what you have to do. So let's talk just a little bit about the medications that are driving weight gain. Now, this is, uh, this is very important. The, medi the, one, the centrally acting medications around uh, neuroleptics and the antidepressants, be they tricyclics, M MAOIs, SSRIs, and the other, those others, they, there are some patients who will experience a lot of weight gain with these medications. I've put on here possible alternatives. Um, and the way that I do this is I talk to the whoever the prescriber is of these atypical antipsychotics or antidepressants, and I say, well, you know, this, this patient is really struggling with weight. Uh, what do you think about changing to such and such and such and such? I really don't take it on myself to, to change the psychiatric medications. I go back to the original provider and, and do a consultation with them, and they're generally glad to talk to me about this. Um, so these are some possible alternatives that I can propose uh, to the prescriber, 
and that's good. One thing I see frequently is um, a lot of weight gain with insulin, sulfonylureas, and TZDs, and those are my least favorite anti-diabetics, and I try everything I can to avoid them. The, um, for patients who are on especially these injectable uh, progesterone agents, the weight gain can be a lot, and I try to get them off of that. I think they're better alternatives um, to that for patients who have demonstrated their susceptibility to weight gain. Um, there are some other tricks here. Um, Benadryl can drive weight gain in some patients, and so for patients who are susceptible, I'll try to get them off of you know, Tylenol PM. Um, some of our beta blockers and alpha blockers are associated with weight gain. It's generally not very much, but it can be. And in those cases, I like to, um, you know, I like to use newer, the newer medications tend to have less weight gain than those older beta blockers. Okay, let's talk about devices. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on these apps. Yes, they're glamorous. They're very, very glamorous. I bet you how many people have one of these on them right now? Yeah, mm -hmm. they're cool. They are so cool. But do they actually produce weight loss? Not by themselves, they don't. They do not produce weight loss by themselves. So all the studies, I'm not showing you these studies, the, all the studies show that if you compare the app, the device with the app, to a standard paper and pencil self-monitoring and instructions, the weight loss is the same. There's no added benefit. I'm not saying these things aren't wonderful. I think anything we do to make it easy, easier for our patients to monitor these behaviors, the better. We need to make it easier for patients to do these things. But they're, they're, these are not going to work on their own. You still have got to do that skills training around changing the behaviors. Let's go on to some of the serious devices. So we've recently seen a lot of new, new devices come out. Um, and we're not, and I'm going to go through these slowly with you. Let's start off with the bottom one. It's the smart device. This hasn't really hit the market yet. But what it is, is it's, a, um, it's like a retainer that you put in your mouth, and it reduces the amount of food you can put in your mouth, and it makes you take smaller bites and process the food more slowly. And it's got a sensor in there, a heat sensor, that hooks up to your Bluetooth over to your computer or your phone or your doctor's computer, and so you can monitor people using this. So if you use it, you will eat more slowly, your meal, you will, your, your bite size will be smaller, and that will reduce food intake. So, the, you know, in our behaviors, we have all these behaviors around put down your fork between bites, chew 25 times, all these other things. It's all about slowing down because it makes you more mindful of what you're eating, and it also allows time for the satiety signals to come back to your brain and go into effect. So if we can slow people down so that they're not gulping their food in five minutes, we can reduce food intake. So that's coming your way. The good thing about it is safety. Now, the bad thing about it is you have to put it in your mouth before you eat. <laughs> and that's some hard for some people. The, the other devices, let's go through them one at a time. So. The first is the balloon. So we have the reshaped balloon and the Arbera balloon. So one is a dual balloon and the other is a single balloon. And so what these are is they occupy space in the stomach. And yeah, that does, it, and it slows gastric emptying and it does, and so it increases the full feelings of fullness after eating. You can put less food in there and you feel fuller with, with less food. Um, but the, and this, and so both balloons have been shown to produce on average about 10 to 11 percent weight loss at six months. The problem with the balloons is these are being taken up by our gastroenterologists and the balloons are great in producing weight loss but what did I teach you yesterday? That weight loss is just the beginning of the game. It's about weight loss maintenance. So unless you tie these balloons to a lifestyle intervention program over the long term or medications or something to help sustain the weight loss, you, you're, you're in trouble. So 
thus far, I have no good studies to show you about how these balloons have been integrated into a comprehensive approach, and that's what's really needed. The vagal blocker is a little different. So what it does is it stimulates the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve feeds back to the brain and it's one of the things that promotes satiety. So it's not all done by hormones circulating to the brain. The vagus itself will uh, reduce food intake. So this is a pacemaker-like thing that's stimulating the vagus. Now this looks pretty good, uh, that but I wanna teach you something about how they try to trick you, these scientists trick you about weight loss. So you're seeing per percent EWL, that stands for excess weight loss. So what that means is, what's the percent of weight loss above a BMI of 25? You know, so in, here's a trick. In general, excess weight loss is half of total body weight loss. So what we're seeing here is not the percent who achieved 5% total body weight loss, it's 2% total body weight loss. So only 39% achieved about 5% or more total body loss. So this, because this vagal blocking therapy is not, has, is not producing very robust weight loss effects, it hasn't been very popular, and you have to put it in with bariatric, with a surgical procedure. Now, I always get a big yuck when I talk about this one. This is Aspire Assist, and it's essentially a gastrostomy. So you have a gastrostomy, and you, after you eat, and you must you must uh, almost liquefy food in the mouth. You've got to chew it, chew it, chew it, chew it. So you have, so you've got to do a lot of oral processing to get it down into the stomach. But then you attach your Aspire Assist and you aspirate the stomach contents. And you discard the stomach contents into the toilet. So yeah, it's kind of yucky, but let me tell you, it allows patients to eat normal meals, and if you have severe obesity and you're, you don't want bariatric surgery and you, you can get substantial weight loss with these, it can, this can be an option for patients. This one belongs in the realm of the obesity specialist. This is not really for primary care physicians, but I want you to know about it. What you also need to know is that bariatric surgery needs to be on your radar screen because we have gotten much better in, produ in, in ha producing these uh, procedures safely and the efficacy of them can be life-saving for some of our patients. So in those guidelines that I worked on that came out in 2013, we gave the strongest recommendation ever for patients who have severe obesity or complicated obesity with BMI 35 and up that we need not just to consider it. We need to advise patients that this is an option for them and that they should be investigating it. And especially for patients who have severe diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, this should be recommended. If you cannot control diabetes, this is an option that we know can, can really improve results with type 2 diabetes. And um, it's now acceptable to uh, perform this procedure in uncontrolled diabetics down to a BMI of 30 or more. So these are the three procedures that are in use. The band is, is very rarely done nowadays, and that's because um, it's not particularly effective. It doesn't really have any effects on these appetite signals. All it's really doing is reducing the size of the gastric pouch, and many patients <laughs> learn to eat around it. It's a pretty good procedure if you have a um, a specialist who can help tighten the band and make it keep working. But because it requires a lot of care, to patient care to keep it working, it's really fallen out of favor. And there are many more um, removals of these bands than there are inserting the bands. So it's unusual nowadays for this, this procedure to be done. The good thing about it is its safety profile, because it's safe. 
the two procedures that are primarily done in the United States are the sleeve gastrectomy, where the outer cur curvature of the stomach is removed and essentially a, an, uh, an opening about this big is left uh, in the stomach. And then the gastric bypass, where the stomach is excised to a small pouch and then it is, there's a Roux and Y connection where the, uh, where the, the remnant of the stomach and the duodenum is hooked up um, to the, the jejunum. So both of those procedures affect satiety signals. When you remove that much stomach, you reduce ghrelin. Patients have less hunger and they, they will remark on these things um, to you. The gastric bypass affects um, GLP-1 and PYY and these other gut uh, signals. So the, we believe that what's going on there is that food is hitting the ileum much sooner, and so that's why we get the stimulation of these gut peptides. But there are other theories about what might be happening in this Roux and Y bypass. It may be affecting um, bile salts. It could also be affecting the, it definitely does have effects on the microflora of the gut that makes those, back, it produces a profile that's much more likely to be associated with leanness than obesity. So we're not quite sure of all these mechanisms, but it definitely has an effect on gastric, on um, hunger and satiety. So this is a great study. It's about 5,000 patients who've had bariatric surgery procedures, and it, for the, it, and, it, and it demonstrates some important things. First of all, you're gonna get um, the safety of these procedures has really improved. So with a laparoscopic Ruin Y procedure, the, um, the, there is, the death is rare, two per thousand in, in this study, and uh, complications such as deep vein thrombosis, failure to be discharged from the hospital in 30 days, those are also very, very unusual uh, complications. Now an open, well, that's when it's done laparoscopically. Now an open procedure has higher rates because we do these open procedures in patients we can't do laparoscopically and those are generally what we call super obesity, BMI 60, 70, 80. So, the good news about bariatric surgery is with these new trained surgeons from, from specialty programs and trained staff and using these laparoscopic techniques, the, the, the mortality rates with bariatric surgery are less than gallbladder removal, cholecystectomy or hip replacement or cabbage. So, we're, so these procedures are in experienced hands are safe and they can have some wonderful results. I wanna show you the Stampede trial. So this is a five-year results of a study where patients were randomized to medical management to a sleeve gastrectomy or a gastric bypass. And these patients all had severe uncontrolled diabetes at study start. So we got about 2% weight loss with medical intervention and the sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass produced uh, um, much, much better weight loss. Um, so this is showing change in BMI uh, from baseline. It's generally about um, five pounds per BMI unit. Um, in this study, the BMIs went down to less than 30 for both, on average, for both the gastric bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy. Um, I have to say that my surgeons don't achieve quite as good results with sleeve gastrectomy as these surgeons did. This is from the Cleveland Clinic and probably the best surgical program in the US. But if you look at the outcomes in terms of diabetes management, they're phenomenal. So I'm showing you on A, the top left, what happened to hemoglobin A1C. So even with the very best medical management by the endocrinologist at the Cleveland Clinic, we have much better A1Cs with our bariatric surgery procedures than we do with that medical management. And if you look at B, diabetes medications, it looks complicated, but just look at the dark, um, the, the darkest bar, 45% after gastric bypass were on no diabetes medicines. That weight loss that occurs with these bariatric surgery procedures 
and the effect on the gut peptides can really have a, a powerful effect in, re, in reducing uh, needs for, for medications for management of type 2 diabetes. And these surgeries can be life-saving. So this is the, the SOS, Swedish Obese Subject Study. They're followed here over 16 years. And you see that in patients who had, in the early days of bariatric surgery, and they're getting only about 16% weight loss here. But look, they have, there's a reduction in uh, deaths from MI and cancer and all-cause mortality in the uh, surgically treated patients compared to this control condition. So I think what we need to, knew, to, to know, all of the primary care practitioners need to know, is that when we interrupt the normal gut, we have effects on many nutrients. <coughs> and so it's very important that we know some of the nutrient deficiencies that are associated with these different procedures. So even if with the band, about a third of patients will develop iron deficiency and thiamine deficiency. And with the bypass um, and Oh, and also with the gastric sleeve, we can we also see a fairly uh, a, a, about half of our patients will develop cal low calcium levels, vi low vitamin D levels, and can develop and are at increased risk of osteoporosis. Again, iron deficiency can occur in these conditions: B12 deficiency, thiamine deficiency, folic acid, and protein deficiency. So we need to know these deficiencies can occur. And when we are following patients who've had bariatric surgery, and there are about 200,000 of these procedures done every year. So you're seeing these patients, these post-bariatric surgery patients in your practice. And when you see them, you need to think, you need to think, what's, what's going on with the CBC? Is there iron deficiency, folate, B12 deficiency? What is going on um, with, the, with osteoporosis. These patients can develop secondary hyperparathyroidism, and so you need to be, they're at increased risk for osteoporosis. You need to be following these things in your clinic when you see them. Um, and then they, every patient who's had a, a bypass and a sleeve needs to be on supplements. So multiple vitamins, calcium and vitamin D, Elemental iron and vitamin B12. We want our patients on these, on these to prevent nutritional complications, not just screen them for follow-up. So the most important one of these is thiamine deficiency because, of course, of Wernicke's encephalopathy, which can be a permanent uh, damage to the brain and mental functioning. So we... Pa patients with all these procedures are at, in, even the band, are at increased risk for thiamine deficiency. And you're going to see this patient, you might be called to the ER, the patient might show up in your office who's got vomiting. And because we don't have a lot of, of uh, stores of thiamine and our decrease, um, and, and all of these procedures will decrease gastric acid production. We need to be thinking about this when we see patients and give parental thiamine because we don't want patients to have the neurological complications. So let me finish up quickly with trying to help you define your role, what you're going to do about weight management. Well, even if you don't want to do weight management per se, it's your job to raise the issue with your patients and keep your patients engaged and coming back. You can be a wise prescriber, download that Endocrine Society um, guidance and, and look through it. You don't have to do it all yourself. You can refer out to, for lifestyle counseling. You can refer to commercial programs, community programs, and, or if you're interested, I encourage you to become an expert. And you can know everything I know by taking a few uh, steps. First of all, is learning how to communicate with patients. And there are some wonderful uh, YouTube videos that are found on this Why Wait website. It's Dr. Scott Kahan from the Stop Obesity Alliance who gives them, and they're great. Or you can get certified by the American Board of Obesity Medicine. All you have to do is be an MD who's got an existing um, 
certification in internal medicine, pediatrics, uh, family medicine, whatever. We've got, um, this year, there were 724 physicians who took this certifying examination, and there are now about 2,500 certified obesity medicine specialists. If I, anything I've said today has interested you in being more knowledgeable about weight management, this is a great way to get educated. You do online CMEs, you have to do uh, at least one face-to-face -face CME, and then you uh, take an examination every, that is offered every December, and you can be just like me, know a little bit about obesity. Thank you. <laughs>